Good morning. Welcome to the second hour of Grace Bible Church. I'm sorry that we're not able to meet together this morning, but we felt like it would be best in light of uh, Rachel's exposure to COVID this past week to, to be overly cautious. Uh, she's feeling fine, but she won't be able to be tested until tomorrow, Sunday. So we just wanted to be careful and uh, and do it remotely like we did early on in the COVID outbreak. Hopefully we'll be back to normal uh, in the next couple of Sundays. Our text this morning is from Revelation chapter 15. If you'll go ahead and turn your Bibles there. You know, we've been building up uh, to the outpouring of the seven bowls for the last several weeks, but it has taken us a while to get there. Uh, we've had a lot of background from, from chapters 12 through 14. John's vision of the woman, the male child, and the dragon in chapter 12. The two beasts, one out of the sea and one out of the earth, that work with the dragon as part of a counterfeit trinity in chapter 13. We saw the 144,000 who were marked back in chapter 7 and came off victorious uh, over the false Christ in chapter 14. They lost their physical lives, but they gained their souls and they gained our martyr's reward in the process. And then we saw these four climactic announcements, three of which were made by angels in chapter 14. So if you think about it, the, the seventh trumpet was sounded near the end of chapter 11. Here we are now about to enter chapter 15 and we still haven't had the seven bold judgments yet. But they're coming. In fact, they're coming next week in chapter 16. We have one more week of, of preparation, and we've entitled uh, chapter 15 as Rejoicing Over and Preparation for the Seven Last Plagues, also known as the Seven Bold Judgments. We'll divide this section up into two parts. One is Rejoicing Over the Seven Last Plagues in verses 1 through 4, and the second is preparing for the seven last plagues in verses 5 through 8. So let's look first at rejoicing over the seven last plagues. And let's read Revelation 15, verses 1 through 4. The Apostle John writes, And I, know, I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels who had seven plagues, which are the last, because in them the wrath of God is finished. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mixed with fire. And those who had come off victorious from the beast and from his image and from the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, holding harps of God. And they sang the song of Moses, the bondservant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, O Lord God, the Almighty. Righteous and true are thy ways, thy King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou alone art holy, for all the nations will come and worship before thee, for thy righteous acts have been revealed. Clearly this chapter and verse 1 of the chapter begins a new section of the book of Revelation compared to what we've seen over the last several weeks and that what we call an intercalation, that preparation for this final three and a half years of the tribulation period. This section does describe the seven last plagues, which are also known as the seven bold judgments. And when John speaks of seeing another sign in heaven, it's in addition to the earlier signs of the woman clothed with the sun back in chapter 12, as well as the great fiery red dragon that we saw back in chapter 12. In both of those uh, visions, John spoke of a, a great sign. And certainly he's seen other visions since chapter 12, but they're not described with that same language. In fact, the sign in chapter 15, the one we've just read, is described as great and marvelous, or great and awesome. The awesomeness of the vision stems from the goal of the seven angels' mission, which is the completion of God's wrath upon the earth. Now that's quite a statement in light of two things, really. One is that the wrath of God has for some time now already been revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. That's the way that Paul describes it in Romans chapter 1. But secondly, by the time we get to this point in the book of Revelation and in the tribulation period, the wrath of God has already been poured out uh, the wrath of the day of the Lord in the form of the seal and trumpet judgments. Now we're approaching the final outpouring of the wrath of God. 
we come to the bold judgments, the seven last plagues, the most severe of all of God's judgments, and the ones that flow uh, from Revelation. The, 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 actually, the flow of Revelation has been building toward the outpouring of this bowl all the way through the book. Now we understand better what John wrote back in chapter 10 when he saw the angel who stood on the land and the sea and who lifted up his right hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things in it and the earth and the things in it and the sea and the things in it, that there shall be delay no longer. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, again, that's the one who, um, who was about to sound the seventh trumpet, when he is about to sound, then the mystery of God is finished as he preached to his servant, the prophets. We said then, and we say again now, that this angel is speaking of the consummation of God's program of redemption, the final punishment of those who refuse to repent, and the final and ultimate redemption of those who have believed the true God and placed their faith in his Son as both their Savior and the Messiah, the King of the nations. The earlier series of the trumpet of the seal and trumpet judgments were temporal punishments to warn people of the severity of God's wrath. But now we've come to the bold judgments, and they are the ultimate uh, climax. They are the uh, ultimate outpouring of God's wrath upon the earth. After this series of, of judgments comes, the wrath of God is finished. Now that doesn't deny that there is an eternal lake of fire where those who have rejected Christ and rejected God and his gospel will be punished forever. But the outpouring of wrath on this earth um, is finished with the outpouring of the seven bowls. Now, in verse 2 of chapter 15, we have a sharp contrast to the impending doom of the seven bowl judgments. John sees yet another vision of victory and worship. The sea of glass, which is probably the same one we saw back in chapter 4. You remember way back then where we saw the one who sits upon the throne, the Father. He had a sea of glass uh, in front of him in that vision. This is probably the same one. In, in both cases, it symbolizes the splendor and majesty of God's throne that sets him apart from all the rest of his creation. There's an intentional distance between God himself on his throne and everything else. Now, in spite of that similarity, there are some differences. You remember when we looked in 4.6, the sea was clear, and perhaps, and we're reading a little bit in, into the text here, more calm, not stirred up. The point was to emphasize God's purity and holiness, and it enhanced the scene of worship by both the four living creatures and the 24 elders. Here in chapter 15, the sea is mixed with fire, and that should not surprise us. This is a scene and a preparation for a scene of judgment. So the fire mixed in the sea of glass serves as a reservoir of God's judgments, which are about to be poured out through the seven last plagues. Now, they mention, or the verse mentions, those who come off victorious from the beast. And those have to be the same people that we saw, the martyrs, back in chapter 12, verse 11. These are the ones who have refused the mark of the beast. They've not loved their lives even unto, the de unto death. And they stand on this, this sea of crystal mixed with fire, which leads to the throne of God. And they hold harps for the purpose of worshiping God. Now, verses 3 and 4 describe the song that these overcomers, these that have come off victorious over the beast, the song that they sing in celebration of the moment that has arrived. And in fact, it's two different songs. One is described as the song of Moses. And that looks back to Exodus chapter 15, where Moses praised God for delivering the Israelites from the Egyptians, who had just drowned in the Red Sea. The song comes immediately after that event. That was a tremendously significant event in the life of Israel. Think about the context there. God had already demonstrated his tremendous power through ten plagues that came over the Egyptians, but through which the Israelites were protected. Those plagues climaxed with the death of the firstborn throughout the land and the passing over that same death angel for those who heard the word of God, believed it, put the blood on their doorpost, and were spared from the death of their firstborn. Israel was delivered 
She went out of Egypt with many possessions. She actually, this text says that they plundered the Egyptians because their fear that had come about through the result of the power of these plagues and the demonstration of God's power through the plagues. So they had gone out from Egypt. They had traveled for some distance and, and then Pharaoh had changed his mind in letting them go. He now pursued them with his full army. And they reached a point where they were trapped between the Red Sea and the most powerful army on the earth at that time. Remember, Israel had never trained for war. They had been largely slaves within the nation of Egypt. They had never had to fight. They were, um, they were multiplied while they were in the womb of Egypt, if you will. But they were not battle tested. And now they're being pursued by the most powerful army on the earth. And they're in a very defenseless position. And yet, God delivered them. He delivered them supernaturally and powerfully. And Moses wrote this song in response to that deliverance. Listen as I read uh, 13 verses of that song. This is not all of it, but 13 verses from Exodus chapter 15. <clears throat> Then Moses and the sons of Israel sang this song to the Lord and said, I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. The horse and its rider he has hurled into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song. He has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him, my father's God, and I will extol him. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his army he has cast into the sea. And the choices of his officers are drowned in the Red Sea. The deeps cover them. They went down into the depths like a stone. Just think about how complete a destruction this was of the Egyptian army. Thy right hand, O Lord, is majestic in power. Thy right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. And in the greatness of thine excellence, thou dost overthrow those who rise up against thee. Thou dost send forth thy burning anger, and it consumes them as chaff. At the blast of thy nostrils, the waters were piled up. The flowing waters stood up like a heap. The deeps were congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil. My desire shall be gratified against them. I will draw out my sword, my hand shall destroy them. You can imagine the Egyptian army thinking that very thing as they pursued these defenseless Israelites. Thou didst blow with thy wind, the sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who is like thee among the gods, O Lord? Who is like thee, majestic in holiness, awesome in praises, working wonders? You can see, and we'll continue to see as we work through chapter 15, a lot of parallels between this song and the one that they're singing here. Thou didst stretch out thy right hand, the, the earth swallowed them. In thy loving kindness thou hast led the people whom thou hast redeemed in thy strength. Just as the song of Exodus 15 was a song of victory for Israel over their, their enemies, the Egyptians, so the song here in Revelation 15 is a song of victory of God's people over the beast, the false Christ, and his system in that day. Now, that's the first song. The second song is described as the song of the Lamb, that is the one for which Christ himself is responsible. It is this song whose content is spelled out in verses 3 and 4. Both songs, both Moses' song and the song of the Lamb, rejoice in the same theme of deliverance. The song of Moses celebrated a physical deliverance, a historical deliverance that also pointed toward this second and ultimate deliverance by God's people. The first one was a physical deliverance. The second one is both physical and spiritual. Salvation first of the soul and, and eventually of a new and glorified body. So it's physical in that sense as well. Just as God's works were great and wonderful when he delivered the Israelites from Egyptian bondage, so they will also cause great astonishment in punishing the world through these seven last plagues. The Song of the Lamb contains praise for the righteousness and truth of God's judgment, a judgment that, again, punishes the wicked and the unrepentant and redeems the righteous and those who put their faith in Christ. It also asserts God's sovereign rule over the nations as, as king of the nations. Now, 
the song continues in verse 4, the song of the Lamb, that is, by asserting the inevitability of fearing God and giving Him glory. And the way it does that is through a two-part rhetorical question. A rhetorical question simply being a question uh, that's raised really for the purpose other than an answer. There is no answer provided to this question or to these two questions, but rather the answer is implied. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? And the implied answer is no one. Everyone will fear and glorify the Lord. And the reasons for this universal praise are found in the clauses of the follow. The first reason is because God alone is holy. Now, the Greek word that's used for, God, for holiness here is not the one that's normally used. Hagias is the, is the term for holiness. Here is hasias. And it's especially an uh, unusual word. It's applied to God only one other time at Revelation 16.5. Here the word describes God's holiness with the emphasis not so much on his sinless character, even though that is a huge part of God's holiness. Here the emphasis is on his unapproachableness, his unapproachable majesty. You know, the fundamental t meaning of the term holy is one that's set apart regardless of who it's applied to or what it's applied to. But here, that's the emphasis. It's really the fact that God is set apart and absolutely uh, unapproachable in his majesty, uh, set apart from the rest of his creation. That's the first reason for the universal worship of God. He's worthy of it as the one who made all things and is apart from all that he's made. The second reason for this universal worship of God is not a rhetorical question, but rather a positive statement of what that earlier rhetorical question implies, and that is the coming of the nations to worship God. After God has, poured, has purged the earth through the final outpouring of his wrath, all those that survive will respond positively to him. They will respond positively to him in worship. In, Messian in the Messianic age, all nations will worship the God of Israel and glorify him. Now, clearly, as you read through the whole of the Bible, this has been God's plan from the very beginning. His plan was to set apart, after the first four events of Genesis, the, the creation, the fall of man, the flood, and the scattering of the nations, God initiated this program of redemption through the nation of Israel. He set apart Abraham as the father of that nation. He supernaturally granted him a child when he and Sarah were beyond the normal age of childbearing. And he multiplied from him his descendants and made them into a special nation, a nation of his choosing, a nation that had a special relationship with the true God. He set them apart from all the other nations and he entered into covenant with them, not so that they could remain set apart forever, but that they might, uh, through obedience to his covenant and to his word, be blessed by God. And the other nations, seeing that their God was the true God, would abandon false gods and worship and be drawn to and worship the God of Israel. So this idea of God bringing the nations to worship uh, is one that runs throughout the Old Testament. It's a very often repeated theme in both the Psalms and the Prophets. And incidentally, it's a very strong argument for premillennialism. It's easy for us to read through history and affirm that the nations of the earth have never worshipped as nations the true God through His Son, Jesus Christ. This song in Revelation 15 and the references we're about to read in the Old Testament are not talking about the church. It's not talking about very small minorities of people within nations that, are, that worship God. These are speaking of whole nations, whole groups of people, all the people within particular nations coming to worship and recognize, bow down before the true God. Now you can see all the references in the slide. Uh, and this is really just a sample of all the references that speak of this concept of the nations. I'm not going to read all of those, but I, do, I am going to take some time to read some of them because I think it's helpful to hear these one right after the other and see how prominent a theme this is in the Old Testament. Psalm 2, 8 and 9. Ask of me, and I will surely give the nations as thine inheritance, 
and the very ends of the earth is thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, thou shalt shatter them like earthen well. It's talking about the strong rule of the Davidic king, the Davidic ruler. And that really was a, a coronation psalm that was sung every time a new ruler came to the throne. And the expectation was that that ruler would rule, not just over the nation of Israel, but over all the nations. Now we know from where we stand now in redemptive history that Christ is the one that will ultimately fulfill that, Jesus Christ. He'll be the one that actually does rule over all the nations. But it was an expectation even all the way back through all the Davidic kings in the Old Testament. Here's another psalm, Psalm 66. For the choir director, a song, a psalm, shout joyfully to God all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are thy works. Because of the greatness of thy power, thine enemies will give feigned obedience to thee. All the earth will worship thee and will sing praises to thee. They will sing praises to thy name. Selah. Psalm 72 is a song written by Solomon. It's not the Song of Solomon. That's a different song. But this is a psalm that Solomon himself wrote. And again, the context is the Davidic king. That's who he's speaking about here. May he, that Davidic king, also rule from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Let the nomads of the desert bow before him and his enemies lick the dust. Let the kings of Tarshish and of the islands bring presents. The kings of Sheba and Seba offer gifts. And let all kings bow down before him. All nations serve him. Again, very clear to us that that will only happen when Christ comes back to the earth. It's certainly not happened yet in Israel's history. It's not yet happened in modern history. But as we read through the New Testament, and especially as we read through the book of Revelation, we know that it happens when Christ comes back. One more from the Psalms, and then we'll look at the prophets. Psalm 86, verse 8. There is no one like thee among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like thine. All nations whom thou hast made shall come and worship before thee, O Lord, and they shall glorify thy name. For thou art great, and dost wondrous deeds, thou alone art God. You can see the same kind of language in Revelation 15. Okay, that's a sampling from the Psalms. Let's look at the prophets. Virtually every one of the latter prophets speaks of the ultimate restoration of Israel. A lot of them talk about the fact that God has had to discipline the nation. They're going to go through a time of trouble, not only in the exile that's already taken place, but even in this future period of the Great Tribulation. That's a time of, pun of discipline and, yes, even punishment for the nation of Israel. But they are refined through that. And... They come out uh, recognizing Christ as their Messiah in a way that certainly the people of Israel don't today and keeping covenant with him. Again, that was God's plan for them from the very beginning. He made these solid oaths and covenants with them and he's going to make sure that they are ultimately fulfilled and that they be the, the holy people that he called them out to be from the very beginning. Let's look at some of these now in the prophets. In Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2 will come about that in the last days the mountain of the house of the Lord, this is talking about the temple being on that series of hills in Jerusalem, will be established as the chief of the mountains. It will be raised above the hills, and all the nations will stream to it. And many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us concerning his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For the law will go forth from Zion, another name for Jerusalem, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations and will render decisions for many peoples, and they will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation, and never again will they learn war. We've talked about this before and how warfare has been such a an early part of man's existence. It goes all the way back to Genesis 14. And, and certainly we've seen warfare over the course of our lifetimes between the nations. What we've not seen is the nations being at peace with one another and being led by a world leader uh, like Christ. And we won't see that until Christ comes back. <clears throat> but this is one of the ways that we know this has not been fulfilled in history is because 
Nations continue to lift up against nations. They continue to war against other nations. That won't be the case once Christ returns. Isaiah 9, verse 6, very familiar passage. A child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increases of his government. Again, this is not just a ruler of the nation of Israel. This is a ruler first over Israel and through that, through that nation over all the other nations. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. And then one more, Daniel chapter 7. You remember that chapter? <clears throat> it's a series of beasts that represent different Gentile kingdoms from Daniel's day down to uh, the final kingdom of the false Christ. And then we see that that kingdom is taken over by the true Christ. Daniel says, I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. And he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom, that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away. Again, in contrast to all those earlier Gentile kingdoms that eventually passed into another kingdom. Once Christ comes, his kingdom does not pass away. His kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. <clears throat> So, though the initial fulfillment of this will be in the Millennial Kingdom, again, after Christ returns at the end of the Tribulation period that we're reading about now in Revelation, and after he establishes his kingdom up, establishes his kingdom upon the earth, that's the initial fulfillment. All the peoples and all the nations of the earth, as they're multiplied over the course of the thousand years, will worship the one true God and worship his son, Jesus Christ. But, we recognize that that's marred at the end of the thousand year period by a revolt. And that's what Psalm 66 was speaking of. There will be people that give feigned obedience to Christ. Um, not at the beginning of the thousand years, but over the course of that time, there will be people who are born uh, and, and repopulate the nations and who externally are subject to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, but in their hearts are not. And it is this group of people, it's a great mass of them by the end of the thousand years, that when Satan is released from his confinement, he's able to stir up one final revolt against Christ, and yet they're not uh, successful in that revolt. Uh, fire comes down out of heaven and puts it down very quickly. So the full realization of the universal worship of God by the nation doesn't occur until the eternal state, until the new heavens and new earth. We read about this in, that, uh, in those chapters in Revelation 21, beginning in verse 22. I saw no temple in it, that is, in the new Jerusalem that has come down out of heaven, for the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. And the city has no need for the sun or of the moon to shine upon it, for the glory of God has illumined it, and its lamp is a lamb. You can tell we're in a new creation here. We don't have the sun and the moon anymore. We don't need them because the city and even the earth is illumined by the glory of God. Now get this part. Again, this is new heavens and new earth. Uh, the old earth and old heavens have completely passed away. And yet we still have nations. The nations shall walk by its light. And the kings of the earth shall bring their glory into it, that is, into the new Jerusalem. And in the daytime, for there shall be no night there, its gates shall never be closed. And they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. That's just a, a way of describing the worship that the nations will bring to the new Jerusalem and to Christ who will be in that new Jerusalem. Now, the last clause of verse 4 provides the reason for why all the nations will come, and that is the manifestation of God's righteous judgments and purging the earth of its rebels. <clears throat> all right, so that's rejoicing over the seven last plagues. Let's look now at the preparation for those plagues in verses 5 through 8. 
After these things I looked, and the temple of the tabernacle of testimony in heaven was opened. And the seven angels who had the seven plagues came out of the temple, clothed in linen, clean and bright, and girded around their breasts with golden girdles. And one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls, full of the wrath of God, who lives forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no one was able to enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. Now, Back in verse 1, John saw the seven angels with the seven last plagues, but they really didn't play any part in those first four ver visions. They just appear there in verse 1. Not, nothing more is said about them. But now, in verse 5, they become the main characters for the rest of the chapter. They come out from the tabernacle in heaven, emphasizing that God himself is the source of these seven last plagues, as he has been for all the seven or all the other previous judgments, both seal and trumpet judgments. I can't emphasize enough the fact that chapters 4 and 5 of Revelation, where we see God sitting upon the throne and the Lamb who was slain and rose from the dead, able to come and take the seven sealed scroll from his hand, that's the foundational vision from which all these other judgments proceed. They're all part of the wrath of God. Some people want to divide up the wrath of Satan and the wrath of God, all of these come from God, and God even uses Satan as uh, an instrument of his wrath against those who will be alive at that time. Verse 6, uh, the angels are clothed in bright, clean bright linen with golden girdles across their breast. The purity of their clothing is appropriate for their mission because it is one of purifying the creation. And their golden girdles are positioned the same as what we saw with Christ. Remember John's vision of the glorified Christ in chapter 1, verse 18, spoke of his being girded with a golden girdle. There we talked about the fact that that was a uh, appropriate clothing for a judge. As Christ was about to bring judgment upon the earth, even before bringing judgment upon the earth, he's judging the, the seven churches. Uh, commending them certainly for the things that they were doing well but also rebuking them and moving upon them and around them as a purifying influence well in the same way these angels that we see now the seven angels with the seven last plagues that will start pouring out those plagues in, in chapter 16 we see that they're judging they're instruments of judgment upon the earth after leaving the temple in heaven, the angels are now in a position to receive these seven bowls of God's wrath. The Greek word here indicates shallow bowls or saucers that are filled to the rim with the wrath of God. Their fullness speaks of both the devastating character of and the finality of this coming divine judgment. Once the angels receive the bowls, the temple undergoes a dramatic transformation. It's now accessible only by God. The angels had been in the, there before, now they come out. The smoke from God's glory and, the, and his power is so intense that no one else can enter the temple. Of course, the priests were the only ones in the Old Testament times that were able to go in there anyway. But this is just a dramatic way of emphasizing uh, how God, powerful and how glorious God is on the one hand also how uh, how his wrath is is maximized at this point in time indeed this emphasizes God's hot and righteous anger the implication is that no one can approach him when he judges in this way and the temple remains in this state until the completion of the outpouring of the bowls that outpouring will carry all the way through to the replacing of the old order, the old heavens and the old earth, with the new Jerusalem and the new heavens and earth and described in Revelation 21 and 22. Well, we've been through a long section here since the seventh trumpet blew. And as we've said before, the intercalation in 12 through 14 gives both background and forecast to the period of the three and a half years that's ruled by the false Christ that's uh, empowered by the dragon, Satan. Now we're finally coming to the outpouring of the bowls in chapter 16. We'll, we'll begin looking at those next week. Now,
There's some similarity between these bold judgments and those of the seals and trumpets, but the bold judgments are even more intense and more universal. The other thing that we're going to see is that these bold judgments have a lot in common with the plagues that God brought upon the Egyptians back in, in the book of Exodus. Like the earlier series, the bold judgments will divide into two groups. The first four, four bold, judgment, bold judgments affect individuals directly, either through personal affliction or uh, punishment through, from objects of nature. The earth is the first division of nature hit by the first four plagues, followed by the sea, the rivers, and the sky. And then the last three judgments are on a more international scale. They're not just affecting individuals, they're affecting whole nations. And they lead the way to this final and major confrontation between the false Christ and his ten, ten kings that are in league with him and the nations associated with those kings and the true Christ and his army that come back, uh, the glorified saints, in which we are a part of, that come back and destroy the false Christ and the nations that are in league with him. We'll begin looking at those next Sunday. Let's bow together in prayer. <clears throat> Father, again, it's just a, an incredible book, an incredible revelation that we have in the book of Revelation about things to come. We can look at your word and see that you've prophesied a number of these things in the Old Testament times. We also see that your prophecy always comes true. You've given us examples already from, that we can see in our own time, things that you predicted hundreds of years before they would happen, even including this series of Gentile kingdoms, and it happened just as the way that you described it in your word. Now we see that that will happen again in the book of Revelation, and we hold tightly to the hope of Christ's return to his coming and using angels to purify his creation. We can rejoice even, Father, even though uh, it is uh, there will be tremendous loss of human life, it is part of your plan, it is an expression of your righteous and holy wrath that you punish sin and wrongdoing. That, too, has an, a purifying influence on us in the way that we live today. And Father, we know that ultimately you will redeem the heavens and the earth. You will purify and purge your creation and even bring in a new heavens and new earth in which only righteousness and peace dwells. And because of what you've already accomplished through the person and work of Jesus Christ, we can know that we will live with you forever in a creation that's no longer under the curse. We thank you for that great redemption, Father. We pray that we would live in light of it, that we would forsake lust and sin and things that displease you in the present age, that we would certainly stay loyal to you when tempted to turn uh, to worship anything else or to, to forsake our loyalty to you. We pray that we would not do that, that we would overcome, and that we would keep these visions of both your coming judgment and wrath against sin and the glorious uh, new heavens and new earth to follow as motivation for us to stay faithful in the present age. Thank you for the time that we've had in your word this morning, Father, and thank you for the great hope that the book of Revelation gives us. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. <laughs>